To Big Data London 2024. Thank you all for coming. Looks like we're already jam-packed. So, um, of course, this being streamed to all the theatres in the show floor today. So, thank you all for coming. Um, what a show we've got for you today um, and tomorrow. We've got two wonderful days. T over 20,000 of you registered um, to be here. Two exhibition halls, over 200 vendors. 14 theatres, over 300 speakers. We've got a new discovery zone for startups. So if you're interested in brand new shoots of technology from around the world, you'll find them in the discovery zone in the National Hall um, next to this one. Um, also, we have data drinks as usual. I'm waiting for a cheer at five o'clock. <laughs> any, any vendor on the brochure or on the app with uh, a little bottle with a D on it, then you'll get a drink there. Um, also, we have a Women in Data Lounge. <laughs> we've got unprecedented networking and we've got meetups and evening events going on all around Olympia. So, what a fantastic couple of days. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors. Couldn't get all the logos on this slide, but thank you to all of you without which this show just wouldn't be possible. And thank you to all of the speakers who've put in all the time in building your presentations and in your rehearsals to run in the 14 theaters throughout the next two days. We got some fantastic implementation experiences across multiple different verticals with speakers and panelists from pretty well every major vertical, uh, key leading edge companies throughout the UK and Europe uh, in particular. In addition, we've got the great data debate this afternoon which I'll be moderating with executives from Calibra, SAP, AWS, Snowflake, and IBM. So please don't miss that if you can. It's in this uh, theatre. So um, at the end of, end of today, between the end of today and happy hour. So I'll try and get it done on time. Um, also, the headline keynote panel tomorrow, we have three British Olympian gold medalists, Rebecca Adlington, Sir Chris Hoy, and Sir Matthew Pinsent moderated by our very own um, Claire Balding um, here in this theater and actually streamed to all theaters to close out the show tomorrow, so please don't miss that either. As always at Big Data London, this is the ninth year, so um, as always, I like to kind of cover where are we in data and analytics today and what are the key trends and how is that impacting on how you build a data-driven enterprise? and where you can find out more about all the things that I'll talk about in a moment uh, at the show. So I went around the internet looking at a couple of surveys and picked up some interesting snippets. So you can see here from the top survey, the appetite for data and analytics is huge right now. Over almost 88% of companies surveyed saying that they w were going to, you know, it was a very, it was high, high priority for them. Uh, almost 82% saying they're increasing their investment which despite 2023 being a tough economic year and even the first part of this year being relatively flat. In addition, we're getting measurable results from that. Other surveys indicating that the size of the AI market is going to quadruple over the next eight years. But the adoption is young. This European Union report published just um, less than two months ago. Um, in Brussels showing the state of the Digital Decade Report with only 11% of enterprises around Europe uh, having adopted AI today. So a long way to go to hit their target of 75% by 2030. As always, I like to show you where's the money going from venture capitalists in data management and analytics. So on the left, as they do every year, data management vendors with the most VC. On the right, analytics and AI vendors with the most VC. And what a change we've had from last year. Still, data management is going up, uh, and it was leading the way uh, on both sides of this slide uh, last year. But probably the key winners there are vendors like Cribble, like Cohesity, like CData, and SnapLogic, who've all had big VC investments this year. But on the right-hand side, dramatic, absolutely dramatic. Um, more money has gone into AI and analytics in the last 12 months than in the last five years combined. And that number of over 19 billion 
was nine and a half billion on my slide last year. Absolutely dramatic swing um, towards AI. So huge investment going on there. In terms of trends, what are the key trends that I see in the industry at the moment? Generative AI was number one last year. It still is. It was just starting out last year. Now it's everywhere. And data catalogs being used as data sources to create vectors to make it uh, enterprise data aware. Also, the emergence of AI agents and AI orchestration in order to automate tasks within the industry, uh, within, within the business, and decision intelligence, intelligence to automate, automate decisions. decisions. And in, in addition, addition to all of that, that uh, we've, we've got, got democratization, democratization because, because of the ability of things like Gen AI, AI uh, AutoML, AutoML, ML, ML Ops, Data Ops, Data, Ops, data, data Observability, observability the, ability the ability to generate pipelines using co-pilots and things like that, that making it way, way, way easier for less skilled, skilled people to go and do this. But, but as we democratize, we better organize, organize it. And so a federated organizational model to try and coordinate activity across multiple democratized teams around the enterprise, absolutely coming in here to be able to harness you know, all of the initiatives that will go on around the enterprise. In terms of architecture, we've seen big changes there. Common data fabric beginning to get adopted as a common platform for multiple teams to develop around the enterprise to be able to share things more easily, share metadata, that kind of thing. And I think in the last 12 months, it's been a year of the emergence of open tables. And, and because of that, causing the morphing of things like data warehouse and lakehouse, whereas in the past we were talking about lakehouse as a replacement for warehouse. What we're seeing now is the convergence of those two. Data products, absolutely uh, being picked up by many organizations now as a way forward to build reusable data sets around, or, or around the enterprise and publish them in internal marketplaces along with other analytical artifacts like machine learning models, BI reports, and AI bots. We've got a shift in terms of application and data integration. For years, those were separate. I'm beginning to see those converge as we can start to see data fabric being able to do both. And in addition to that, also big changes in the world of data governance. We've got several theaters talking about that this year, but data and AI governance, uh, a really big topic still in 2024. But here I think we're shifting away from um, standalone individual tools for a particular discipline to getting into universal data governance, complete AI-driven multidisciplinary data governance platforms, whether that's part of data fabric or separate platforms. But also because the European Union AI Act is now live legislation across 27 countries with the EU not far, or sorry, with the UK not far behind, um, we now have AI governance is front of mind within a lot of organizations because the penalty is 6% of global revenue as opposed to 4% of global revenue, which was what GDPR was. So very eye-watering penalties there. And for me, um, last but not least, integration of everything we're building into apps and into processes. And that's beginning to happen now in package applications. 12 months from now, I think that's going to be huge at Big Data London. As I said, generative AI is everywhere. It's in every aspect of computing today. Last year, I talked about it in data management and analytics. Now it's everywhere. We've got vector databases popping up everywhere. We've got AI-driven infrastructure for uh, server management for networks, for um, storage. We've got AI in data warehouses and databases and lake houses with uh, vector data types and functions. We've got um, co-pilots to be able to generate uh, queries. And we've got the invocation of large language models from SQL and Python. We've got the ability even to do conversational analytics on backup data. Cohesity recently announcing that, for example. Data fabric with AI baked in to generate pipelines, to do AI-driven data and AI governance, to be able to do conversational data modeling, um, to do you know, uh, AI-assisted discovery and curation of data. In, in analytics tools, we've got the ability not only to do conversational queries, 
but we also have the ability to explain insights. And I think this year we're going to see the emergence of structured data insights being brought together with unstructured data insights to offer more value there. Of course, running um, and building um, generative AI applications in data science has already been here for a while. I think an, another new area is content management vendors have woken up to do analytics on top of all the unstructured content housed in their content management systems. And as I said, generative AI generating application and process integration data flows and baked into software as a service apps. So tons of stuff going on in this area. And yet expectations are raised even higher by the emergence of the new kid on the block. AI agents, so-called agentic uh, environments, which are very, very new, still evolving here. So expect things to change rapidly. But this is the ability to interact with uh, customers and employees to be able to automatically reason through various design patterns, some of which are still evolving with multi-agents, I don't think is uh, yet ready for prime time. <clears throat> but then the ability to act by agents automatically orchestrating and sequencing uh, the series of actions that need to be ha happening and then running those uh, across uh, across your organization and continually observing from that. But it's not a replacement for all kinds of AI. You know, we've still got machine learning out there, whether it's predictive and prescriptive, which of course is still very valuable. What does it all mean? What's the impact of Gen AI everywhere? Well, you know, we are democratizing everything. And if you're going to democratize everything, you better be able to coordinate it. And uh, that's why I think a program office is really going to be important. And being able to share and reuse things across multiple teams is going to be very important. But conversational analytics has got to be more than just text to SQL. It's got to be able to allow you to bring together uh, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive analytics as well. It's got to be able to explain the insights uh, to people to understand in layman's terms. It's got to be able to reason and make recommendations and cause actions. And it's got to be able to link to planning so that we can ensure that the actions that are being recommended are going to contribute to common outcomes. And hopefully got reinforcement learning in there so that we can get progressively better at doing this. With all of that going on, we're going to see an explosion in concurrent users. Um, and as a result of that, um, we're going to see um, far more happening there. Uh, we need to scale to be able to handle it. So we need um, a whole lot more going on with respect to um, coordinating across multiple teams. Uh, I think common fabric to be able to support multiple development. Also, I think data fabric um, is now being able to do multiple things, not just uh, ETL or ELT. We can build, generate pipelines for uh, data products, for processing unstructured data for real-time streaming analytics for Gen AI applications. That's just in, in, in data and analytics. But also, I can do it with a Gen AI user interface. And I can do it in operational uh, application and process integration and closed loop pipelines and even master data management. Open tables really making a difference. The adoption in the last 12 months of support for Iceberg has been staggering almost every single database vendor now supporting Iceberg in addition, as open tables in addition to proprietary tables. And that's transforming things as we allow multiple engines to access data, not just the database itself. And that's caused an explosion in the number of data lake offerings in the market, lake house offerings. There are several vendors now in the lake house business, much more competitive than a year ago. But the big thing for me is it's going to help us tear down the silos. It's going to allow us to uh, come up with a more modern data architecture where we can build data products and publish them once, share them across multiple analytical workloads without having to copy the data uh, for every different analytical workload that's out there. But also, marketplace is also exploding. Um, the number of vendors on this slide has doubled since last year. So lots more data marketplace offerings available to publish uh, data and analytical products to share. And then we can consume those 
build new things and publish them back so that we can take advantage of that and then make the marketplace central to the enterprise um, so that we can uh, start to see what's available and wire it into the applications that we have. And I think also another kind of AI agent, AI monitoring agents in real time, monitoring conditions across the enterprise. So we're gonna go from data observability to business observability, in my opinion. And wire the whole thing together to get end-to-end -end intelligent business going forward. So really exciting times. One final word on data governance. Not a sexy topic, but we are still struggling with this. Multiple data governance disciplines, armies of administrators trying to keep policy synchronized across lots of different systems. And I think for me, for the first time this year, really seeing a shift a shift from individual tools doing individual disciplines and struggling to share metadata with each other without an industry standard to new universal data governance platforms with way more than a catalog, but a whole range of data governance apps sitting on top of all of that that we can put to use to govern data across a distributed data estate. And probably the new thing within there that's hot for me is a new data governance action framework, which, uh, and I'm really thrilled to say that the number one specialist in metadata management, in my opinion, in the world, Mandy Chessel, is here in the data governance and AI theater tomorrow, lunchtime, along with Dan Wilson, both ex great data debate panelists. You should really go and see that. They really know what they're talking about. But obviously, universal data governance trying to govern a distributed data state and enforce policies everywhere. And, but we need AI, we can't do it all with humans. And this survey published by IBM showing without AI trying to govern data breaches is costing businesses $4.8 million a breach. And with AI, it's less than half of that. So without doubt, there's benefits. But there's a lot of worry about AI. Still accuracy and intellectual property infringement are the top worries that most organizations currently have, at least according to this survey by McKinsey. So we need AI governance, and that's going to be hot uh, at the next two days. We need best practice, use cases, templates. We need formal processes, explainable AI. We need AI observability and guardrails, and tools to implement it, some examples of which you'll see here, all most of them at least on the show floor that you can go and take a look at what they have. So with that, with that uh, we've got 14 wonderful theaters. If you're struggling to find the data engineering theater, it's upstairs for the first time this year in a brand new theater as part of the reconstruction going on here at Olympia. So if you're struggling for uh, data engineering, go upstairs and you'll find it. Um, apart from that, have a wonderful time at the show, and thank you all for coming. Many thanks indeed.